Amen. Welcome, everyone. If you are new to St. John's and you haven't seen me, I'm Pastor Ginny, and I just want to say what a joy it is to be back after vacation. I especially want to thank Pastor Hank, Pastor Mary. I want to thank Pastor Skip for coming out of retirement and preaching. What a joy. I mean, they did a fabulous job, a fabulous job. And it is a sign of an extremely healthy, loving, wonderful church that you can go away on vacation and things just run smoothly. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for our team. We have a lot of fun. We work hard. And we know that we've been called to an astonishing vision here in the city of Columbus, which is, I think, still the fastest growing city in the nation. So we have quite quite a job ahead of us. So um, I did want to, though, um, take a special moment because we know that our faith is 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not, right? Before we share the peace of God, I did bring you back a little something from the East Coast because we were in the East Coast visiting family, and we brought a piece of taffy for each of you from what is considered the best saltwater taffy, according to the Wall Street Journal, on the eastern seaboard. So if you'll please pass this around, um, and, uh, and, and uh, if you have uh, sensitive dental work, uh, you might want to just trade your piece for something else. But we brought just a little sweet treat back from um, the vacation so that we can share with you all our thanks for uh, providing this time away so that uh, we could visit family, including the newest members in our family and the little ones who grow up so fast. So thank you all for your care and your consideration while we were away. Pastor Hank is graciously preaching today as I settle back in and catch up on everything. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please greet one another with words of welcome and the peace of God. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. The works of the Lord are great. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The works of the Lord are full of honor and majesty. The Lord's righteousness endures forever. The Lord has sent redemption to his people. The works of the Lord are faithful and just. Holy and awesome is the name of the Lord. Holy and awesome is the name of the Lord, and his praise shall endure forever. You're invited to remain standing in body or spirit as we continue worship together through song. Salvation 
I invite you to be seated. The first Bible reading is from the book of Psalms, the 145th chapter. It can be found on page 593 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bible. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to her church. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. It can be found on page 92 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he, Jesus himself, knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered Jesus, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his other disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, Jesus told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew immediately to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to her church. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Some friends in the sanctuary back there, some friends at home watching. So the story today, Jesus and his friends, the disciples, have been teaching and healing people. And all of a sudden they realized, well, it's dinner time and there's like 5,000 people there. So that means we would fill this sanctuary 10 times. That's how many people were there, if you get the idea, right? And a child comes forward with five fish and a couple loaves of bread. And Jesus said, you feed them. And the fish and the bread multiplied, 
and were enough to feed all the people. So St. John's has a feeding ministry called The Largest Table. Raise your hand if you're involved in The Largest Table. Several are. Thank you for doing that. We love you. And I hear stories every week at The Largest Table. I heard two this week. The first one was a man we had not seen in quite a while. I asked him how he was doing, where he had been. He said, well, I've been in rehab. He said, I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> and I've been an alcoholic for three decades now. And I finally got to rehab and I'm sober and I'm hungry. <laughs> so we fed him and heard, his, heard some more of his story. And then there was another man that I met on the porch on my way out on Wednesday. And he said, um, he said, my wife died recently and I have this box of ashes, her remains. He said, I'm living in my car right now. I'm really close to getting an apartment but I'm in my car right now and I don't want to leave her ashes in my car. I'm afraid somebody will take them. And he said, the only place I could think of to come was this church, because I know the people in this church and I trust the people in this church with what he called his most precious possession. And so we took the ashes, I took his information so that people would know what that was and why it was here and that he was coming back. So those are the, some of the stories that we hear every week at the largest table. So I thought we'd start a little project today for the month of August. We're going to do a summer food drive. On your way out today, grab a bag. It has a list on the front of things that we need for the largest table, like, um, like um, individual fruit cups, lemonade and fruit and fruit punch, drink mix, plastic forks, napkins, but it also includes things like men's socks and razors and shaving cream. Those are things that we constantly have people asking for. So I thought, let's put it on the list. So here's an opportunity to do that, to purchase as much or as little as you want, bring it in the bag, and when you come in on Sunday mornings in August, you can put it on the table right there and we will watch our collection grow and we will feed the 5,000 like we do every week at the largest table. Let's pray, one, two, three. Dear God, thank you for this story that reminds us that you work miracles every day. Help us to love others the way you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.
Christian church, right? Did you see that little? We all saw the little jam, right? We all saw him get down, going out. You know why he was so excited? You know why he was so excited to go to children's church? Because he believed that he was about to have a good time. And I bet you they're down there having a really great time learning about the Lord and learning about God. And so with that same joy, with that same expectancy, with that same knowing, you got to believe in everything that God is doing for you because God
I'm not sure if I need to be preaching today or not. That was, that was a participatory sermon uh, that was just wonderful. Um, Y'all know the music's great. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and standing up here or being up here, looking out and seeing all of you singing along with these folks was just a joy, just a joy. I... Um, that's, that's what we're called to do. God wants us to make a joyful noise. And we have a community choir here at <clears throat> St. John's, and all of you are the community choir. And we have special performances throughout the year if you decide you want to be up in front of people singing to them and with them, but y'all are the community choir. <clears throat> and it's just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I am grateful that you are here. I am grateful for our music ministry, for Amber, for Matt and their leadership of the band, um, and just bringing us into a place of worship where we can feel, literally feel the spirit move. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. Amen. Here's a little story about three Buddhist monks sitting by a lake, deep in meditation. Suddenly one stood up and said, oh, I forgot my mat. He stepped onto the waters before him. He walked across to the other side while their, where their small hut was. And when he returned, the second monk said, I just remembered I haven't dried my washed clothes. He too strode calmly right across the surface of the water to the other bank and returned in a few minutes the same way. The third monk was watching all of this intently, figuring that this was a test of his own skills, and he loudly declared, so you think your abilities are superior to mine? Watch me. And he ran over to the edge of the water, and no sooner did he put his foot in, then he fell to waist high water. Unfazed, he got up, he waited out, tried again, again, and again to no avail. And after watching this performance in silence, the first monk looked to the other monk and said, Do you think we should tell him where the stepping stones are? <laughs> now, if I were to ask you, which of these monks you most identified with, my guess is that you'd give the same answer as me, and that's that third one. Often I need some guidance to find out what was there all along. Part of that is coming to church, I guess, learning new things and relearning old things about the Bible, about Jesus, about God, about being a Christian. But I also do an awful lot of trying to figure it out on my own and getting soaking wet in the process. Miracles. The Bible is filled with them. A talking donkey. A floating axe head. The sun standing still. Water into wine. Lazarus raised from the dead. The miracle of the resurrection of Christ around which our entire faith is centered. And in the gospel text this week from John, we encounter two miracles in a row. The only two, by the way, that appear in all four of the gospels. The feeding of the multitudes and Jesus walking on water. And since we're talking about miracles today, and because I'm an ex-evangelical who grew up in a Christian tradition that taught that the Bible was to be taken literally from cover to cover... I think it's important for me to say that the way I now approach the Bible and Pastor Jenny and Pastor Mary approach the Bible is that it's impossible to take the Bible seriously if you take it literally. 
I also think that me being gay and being here in the pulpit is a testament to that, taking it seriously and not literally. And this is simply to say that when we're looking at stories of miracles that appear in the Bible, instead of concerning ourselves with the accuracy of the account, we should focus on the meaning by asking questions. What do these stories tell us about our faith, about the nature of God and the nature of Jesus, about how we navigate the modern world we're in while looking at ancient texts whose writers could not possibly have imagined what life would be like 2,000 years later. There's a quote from John Dominic Crossan that is one of my favorite about miracles. It's from his book, The Historical Jesus, The Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant. And he writes, my point, once again, is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they had told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. Now, all of that now said, I want to take a look at chapter 6 of John and its significance to its contemporary audience and its significance to us today. An important thing to note about the Gospel of John is that it's focused very much on Christology, which is just a fancy seminary word that describes what we think about the divinity of Christ. And the writer of John begins their gospel not with a story about Jesus' life or ministry. Instead, John 1 begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right out of the gate, with a mostly unambiguous statement about the divinity of Jesus. And the author of the Gospel of John continues that journey, focusing on signs of Jesus' divinity, including here in chapter 6. And John's telling of these stories differs a bit from where they appear in the three synoptic Gospels. And there are four particular distinctions that John gives us here, and that is he mentions the Passover. The other ones do not. He calls the Sea of Galilee the Sea of Tiberias. It's set on a mountain, and Jesus himself distributes the food to the people. Those are distinct to John's, John's reading of this miracle story. That John mentions this story took place around the time of the Passover is significant for the purposes of signs pointing to the Messiah, to Christ's divinity. When we think about the Old Testament, when did the Passover happen? What was the event? It was when the Israelites escaped enslavement in Egypt. And in the New Testament, the big significance of the Passover in the story of Jesus is what? His arrest, crucifixion, the Last Supper, all of those things during Holy Week. The Last Supper, in fact, was a Passover Seder meal. Now, we've all heard of the Sea of Galilee. It's mentioned lots in the Bible. And much of Jesus' ministry was in the vicinity of that inland sea. That's where he called his first disciples, calmed the storm, and walked on water. But why does the writer of John mention that it's also called the Sea of Tiberias? Well, it's a reminder to his readers that they didn't have control of that land. The Roman Empire certainly didn't call it the Sea of Galilee. They're the ones that called it the Sea of Tiberias. And they couldn't care less about anything except the names that they appropriated or the names that they gave to places. The mountain, why is this significant? Well, the mountain is significant to this story because the telling brings to mind in these folks the story of Moses, 
who went on Mount Sinai to commune with God, to get the Ten Commandments, to go back and forth between God and the people. And finally, the distinction that Jesus distributed the food, whereas in the other accounts in the Gospels, the disciples are tasked with distributing the food. Jesus actually distributes the food, and some theologians have referred to this event, this miracle, this story, as the First Supper. Because Jesus has specific imagery, it carries into our imagery of the Last Supper with Jesus giving thanks for the bread, breaking the bread, and giving it to the people. The people get their fill of food, and they want to make Jesus a king. And think about the Sea of Tiberias, the Passover. Being a king is not good news when you're in occupied territory. But Jesus, when they're going to force him, John says they're going to force him to be king. Jesus goes up the mountain to seek solitude. More imagery that we see from the Moses stories, foreshadowing the trial and crucifixion of Jesus when he is identified as the king of the Jews. And the miracle of Jesus walking on water when paired with this story that brings to mind the exodus brings to mind that he didn't have to part a sea to get across it. He walked across the sea. So it draws a parallel, but then sets him above. His divinity brings him above just a mere prophet like Moses. And the writer of John is pretty clear with the imagery of the significance of Jesus' role as a prophet and with the signs that Jesus is the Son of God. And I think it's important for us to remember anytime we read these scriptures, the Gospels were not contemporary accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. Christian churches had popped up in, in cities around the empire a few decades before the Gospels were even available for people to read. The early Christians knew just as much about the stories in the Gospels as we do today. Now, I realize all of this might have been more of a history lecture than you probably expected when you got up and came to church this morning, but I do think it helps in our effort to discern what these stories mean for us today, and it certainly helps me to verify that taking the Bible literally shuts the door on any movement of the Holy Spirit when reading the Word of God. But why does this stuff matter today? How does it apply to us? What are we supposed to do with all of this? Where do we find the stepping stones beneath the water that let us move across the the lake? Are there even any stones? A couple of things. First, these stories help us understand the history of our Christian faith more completely. We say here that our faith is 2,000 years old, and that's true. But there's still a far more ancient connection stretching back thousands upon thousands of years. Understanding Jesus as a prophet like Moses or Elijah brings continuity with the the past of Israel and the contemporary nature of our Christianity as followers of Jesus. Instead of making Jesus distinct from the Hebrew prophets, John shows Jesus stepping into that role for the people then And it serves as a reminder for us, as it was for those folks, that the same God who sought Israel through the voices of prophets now seeks all people through Jesus. Second, these miracle stories remind us that while God seeks us, we must continue to seek God as well. Part of our calling calling as followers of Jesus is to participate in the working of of miracles. That's how we meet God. And we do that through ministry. 
Now, it would be impossible and pretty much tragic to read this story in the Bible and not talk about the largest table. This is a key ministry of our church and for decades has faithfully and consistently provided a hot meal to our poorest and most vulnerable neighbors. Even during the pandemic, when we were forced to switch to a to-go model outdoors, not a single meal was missed. The largest table continues now down the street at 125 East Broad. Every Wednesday afternoon with an invitation to an optional meditation service and communion and then a meal that is served by volunteers. Pastor Mary does a wonderful job of coordinating the ministry and I can tell you that those who volunteer are just as filled physically and spiritually as our guests who are there each week. And I know some of you who are here volunteer at the largest table, if you'd raise your hand and let us know, well, I mean, Amanda, Amanda and Tony, you have to because you're pictured right there front and center. Um, but yeah, and if you want to get involved, see Pastor Mary. She can get you slotted in. Uh, if you can't do it regularly, if you can come on a day off, um, or if you just happen to be downtown during lunch on a Wednesday, you can stop by and enjoy some food and some fellowship with those folks. So continuity of our faith history and actively participating in the work of miracles, the work of bringing about the kingdom of God, are two things coming out of these narratives. The third is moving from a mindset of scarcity and fear to a mindset of abundance and hope. Again, it takes us from a mindset of scarcity and fear to a mindset of abundance and hope. Today, 2,000 years after this story happened, we live in a time when we have more access to knowledge than at any other time in human history. We can access information in multiple ways instantaneously and still receive more information than we didn't ask for or necessarily want. It used to be said that knowledge is power, but it might as well be said that knowledge is paralysis. This brings me to talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term that was introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw, which she defines as a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it locks and intersects. It is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and privilege. And the graphic that's on the screen there was really the best one that I, I could find that visually demonstrates how dizzying it can be to think about all of the ways identities and even systems intersect and overlap with one another. This is, to me, what knowledge paralysis looks like. Because when I think about all these things, all of the systems in place that cause harm, I can't help but sometimes, more than sometimes, just say there's nothing I can do. It's overwhelming. That's a mindset of scarcity and fear. It's also a mindset of privilege because there are many forms of oppression that will never affect me because I'm a cisgender white male. Yeah, I'm gay, but I could pass as straight. And maybe if not if someone was at the pride parade where I came out multiple times during the parade, but the point is I still have plenty of privilege. But it's because of intersectionality that I also know that anything I can do to either help dismantle oppressive systems or help alleviate the symptoms being suffered by those suffering under those systems will still have an impact on anything and everything. It's like the vibrations on a spider web. Still, it's overwhelming, which, what do I pick? What do I focus on? 
That leads to the paralysis. There's so many things. Well, St. John's has identified three areas in which we have chosen to focus. One is food justice. The largest table is part of that. Volunteering at the Mid-Ohio Food Bank is part of that. Another is justice for LGBTQIA plus people. And the third is a commitment to becoming anti-racist. Three things for us to focus on at St. John's. All are connected to one another. All are connected to people, things, and systems that intersect. Three, for me, is a lovely number because it's easy to remember a list of three things. If you watch Sesame Street and you're around my age, you might remember the little kid going to the market saying, a loaf of bread, a carton of milk, a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a carton of milk, a stick of butter. Loaf of milk, carton of bread, stick of butter. To remember those three things on the list going to the supermarket. Well, we have lists of three straight from Scripture. The prophet Micah tells us God just wants us to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly. And in the New Testament, Jesus tells us love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. Three things from the Hebrew Bible and three things from the Christian Bible. Now, I will share that one thing I found that was interesting when I was searching the internet for graphics was I had to create the one for the great commandment because all of the ones I could find said, love God and love your neighbor. They said nothing about loving yourself. And I submit to you, as I've done before from this place, that you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. As a matter of fact, for people who were raised in Christian traditions like mine, we were told that we are fundamentally unlovable. There is absolutely no way God will ever accept you, will love you. You are dirty, you are sinful, you are unlovable unless you participate in a transaction to be saved. And I think that's the reason a lot of folks who are in evangelical traditions, like I was, are so hateful to other people. It's like RuPaul says, if you don't love yourself, how are you gonna love anybody else? So three things. And I want you to remember there are three things in the great commandment because you won't see that. And I think it's a shame that you won't see that. And for those of us who are coming from traditions that told us we were unworthy and we were unlovable, I want to tell you now that that is a lie. Jesus would not have said to love our neighbor as ourselves if it meant us treating other people like crap because we think we're crap. Let's do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. Having just three things to remember is a great way to move from a mindset of scarcity and fear into a mindset of abundance and hope. The fact is that in the face of injustice, inequity, oppression, and all the other horrible things out there, whatever, anything, whatever we have, whatever we can do is not gonna be enough. But these stories, these miracles in John 6, Tell us that not enough isn't the final answer. When our not enough is still our best and placed in the hands of Jesus, it becomes more than enough. 
And if that's not motivation to move from a mindset of scarcity and fear to one of abundance and hope, then I don't know what is. Let's pray. Holy Creator, who loves us so, no matter what, and invites us to love ourselves, love our Creator, love our neighbor, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember that scarcity is not your way, that fear is not your way, that we are meant for abundance and for hope. We've seen it happen in this congregation, in this church, with the gifts that we've been given as we continue our journey in this space that we we don't own, but you have given us gifts to keep us here and to to keep your spirit moving with the ministries that we have. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we move into our time of offering, I just want to remind you about the connection cards that are in uh, your pew, or you can fill out one online or scan that QR code that's on the screen if you're here in the sanctuary and fill one out. Uh, and to let you know, this week, uh, men's group is meeting in person. It's the fifth Monday of the month. We'll be at North High Brewing in Dublin uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, and then kickball is happening at 6.30 this week. Unfortunately, last week, because of the pop-up storm, we got rained out. Um, but that will happen next week on August 6th, our doubleheader, and then we'll head to Pecan Pennies and enjoy uh, some fun together. So keep your eyes out for that uh, in the newsletter and on the website. Friends, as we come to our time of offering, I ask that you please meditate with me on these words. Generosity encourages us to consider what we have to share beyond our own use. May we share like the young person shared their lunch that was used to feed thousands. The miracle starts with that act of sharing and faith.
please stand as you're able for our doxology. pray. Holy God, may these gifts that we have received be used out of abundance and hope. And now we pray together as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's sing some more.
This is the celebration song, so uh, stand and worship as you're able. Beloved, may you, according to the riches of God's glory, the presence of Christ, and by the power of Spirit, be strengthened in your inner being, 
be rooted and grounded in love, and be filled with the fullness of God as you go from this place. Amen. But don't go yet. Stick around for the postlude.